so up in Scotland, we have witnessed a breed of beef teetering on the knife edge between survival and extinction. And only time will tell as to whether the Aberdeen Angus, the purebred Aberdeen Angus, will survive. But there is hope. It comes from the success story of father and son team Bob and Todd Williams. They have put heart and soul into reviving these longhorn cattle, a breed that was so close to extinction that only 30 years ago there were less than 200 breeding females. Why longhorn? Why, what's so special about the longhorn? I was brought up in Suffolk and there was a herd there long ago and I saw them as a little boy once being exhibited at the Suffolk show and I thought, well, one day I'm going to have some of those myself. I passionately feel for their beauty. But as, as a little boy, what do you go for? You go for their horns, you go for their temperament, their colour, everything about them. And I've always felt that. I, could, I, I would find it very difficult to keep any other breed. I've had these for 30 odd years now. As ever, the most important thing is flavour. Do these beasts taste any good? The butchers tell me that the marbling of the meat is very noticeably good. The flavour is second to none. That's not to say that it is the best. I make no claim about our meat being the best, but I don't know of any meat that's better. Well, I've got to say, as a, a cook, as an Aussie who yeah. came over here and wasn't that excited by beef, when I started to taste beef like this, I mean, I was just enamoured. I've got to say thank you for persisting for so long because it's just brilliant. I mean, it's just lovely to see that your work that you've done has actually taken this breed and now it's becoming a I might tell you there are now a few Aussies taking out long horns. <laughs> Good. That's what I say. Come on, Aussie. Bob's son, Tom, has picked up the mantle and is carrying on the farm. And he's embraced another side of the business to ensure its success. These longhorns have been around my entire life. I'm 32. Um, my parents bought their first one, I think, when I was uh, born. Uh, so it's really great to have a continuation of that breeding herd. The breed has really improved in numbers and so on. We've got great sales now with the beef and with conservation grazing as well. It's turned into a really great business. People will be unaware that you need to graze certain parts of the country. You can't get on with big machinery. You can't mow the lawn. You can't do those sort of things. So you've got to have animals in place to make sure you keep it at a certain level. Is that right? Cattle are absolutely fantastic for conservation. I think that the key to any successful farming operation is making sure that your end product is sold down the correct streams. We don't have large quantities of beef, so we need to ensure that we sell them at a premium. If we can do conservation work and sell our beef in turn at a premium, then I would say that would be a good key to success. And here's the one we've been waiting for, the quintessential British Sunday lunch using some very British longhorn beef. Roast British beef. Roast British rare breed beef. Probably the most important meal served to the British public and envied the world over. For me, the best piece of roast beef comes from this wonderful, absolutely extraordinary four bone rib. It is full of texture, full of flavour, it's a muscle which has been worked quite a bit, so it's really got depth, but at the same time when it's roasted slow, it's tender and melt in your mouth. This is going to be my slow roast rib of beef with mustard crust and Yorkshire puddings. This is a really expensive piece of meat, but that piece of meat will feed a whole family at Christmas, and that actually means that it's quite good value. Keep the fat. I'll say it again. It's essential for moisture during cooking and you can always cut off the excess later. Score into the fat, then rub some vegetable oil all over it and then massage in some salt. On top of that, to protect it even more and to make it more value for money, I'm going to put a mustard crust. The thing is, I like stuffing. I like stuffing on chickens, I like stuffing in pork, and very few people make stuffing with beef because here, 
in this country, you guys do Yorkshire puddings. Whereas a kid, for me, growing up in Australia, we didn't do Yorkshire puddings. My grandmother used to do lots and lots of stuffing. And I think it was because everything was quite expensive and she wanted to stretch. She wanted to get really good value for money. She wanted to feed a family. So therefore, we used things like stuffing rather than anything else. And it wasn't until I got here 20 odd years ago that I learned how to make a Yorkshire pudding. Um, but they're pretty good, even as an Aussie. The mustard crust is easy to make. Just combine breadcrumbs, whole grain mustard, a couple of eggs, fried chopped onions, water, and pepper. Really good amount of pepper because it's a decent piece of beef. It deserves a good bit of seasoning. Because this is a slow roast, put some carrots in the pan as a sort of trivet so the air can circulate around the beef. And just plaster all that wonderful crust on top. Add water to the pan to stop it burning and butter the foil to stop it sticking. Put in a preheated oven at 220 degrees, but immediately drop it to 200 and leave for two hours. Then whip off the foil for the last hour. The crust has gone all crispy on top. The fat starting to melt away inside here. The eye of the meat is lovely and brown. The bones are starting to come up away. Look, you almost just pull them out. Look at that. Just delicious. But inside, right in the middle, that beef is going to be beautifully rare as well. So all the good bits. But whatever you do, don't start to carve it now. It needs to relax. It needs to sit. This is where we all go wrong. Give it a rest, Britain. Use the time to get your Yorkshire puddings cooked my way. Pour your milk into a bowl and add eight eggs and a pinch of salt. And there'll be people now screaming, saying, what do you think you're doing? That's not how you make Yorkshire puddings. That's how I make Yorkshire puddings. A lot of people put the flour in first, put a well in the middle, put their eggs in, and then they add their milk afterwards. I don't believe that works as well, because I think sometimes the amount of delay that you have with the eggs and the flour means the flour gets lumpy. So this way, I mix my eggs and my milk and my salt together. Then add your flour and whisk. Whisk until your biceps look like Popeyes. It's probably the consistency of double cream before you start to whisk it. Gets rid of my dingo wings. Instead of preheating your tin in the oven, just pop it onto the heat and put lard into each pudding mold. Not vegetable oil, because vegetable oil burns. Then wait until the fat is so hot it shimmers. Sizzling, just to the top. And then straight in that oven. Get in the oven as fast as you possibly can. When it's all ready, take out your roast potatoes and my delicious Yorkshire puddings. Carve your rest of beef and serve it up with pride. We call that the carver's rights. The carver of the beef gets to have the first taste of it. That's a slow roast, rib of beef, mustard crust, and Yorkshire puddings. The Australian way.